Hey everyone, Dr. Michael Carey here, and today we're going to continue our conversation from Revelation 10, which is the intervening period between the sixth and the seventh trumpet judgment. And today we're going to be talking about the mystery of God. Now, if you missed the last video, be sure to go back and watch it. And while you're at it, make sure to hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell so that you don't miss a single video post. Not to mention, it really helps the channel when you subscribe. In fact, we are now approaching 16,000 subscribers and are on the way to reaching our next goal of 20,000 subscribers. And I'm asking you to help us get there by clicking the subscribe button on your screen. Even more, you know, there's something very supernatural that happens in our heart when we step out in faith to let the world know that we've made the decision to believe God's word and to stand on the side of Bible prophecy. So would you subscribe? Would you stand with me today and be a voice for the fact that Jesus is coming back soon? Also, because people have been asking, we are a listener-supported ministry, and you can find out more about helping us continue to share this content all over the world by visiting us at the website on the bottom of your screen. And I want you to know that I truly appreciate and I value your prayers. And every donation, regardless of whether it's large or small, really makes a difference and it helps the ministry. All right, let's jump right into our topic for this video. So as Revelation 10 opens, the Apostle John sees a mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed in clouds with a rainbow on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet were like pillars of fire. And this angel was carrying a small book that was open. And when he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, he cried with a loud voice that John describes as a lion's roar. Now, at this point, the angel then raises his hand towards heaven, and he swears an oath by the ever-living God. Check this out. Revelation 10, verse 5 and 7 says this, The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, this is fascinating to me because the angel of the Lord, this mighty angel declares that when the seventh trumpet sounds, that the time of waiting for God to fulfill his purposes on earth is over and that the mystery of God would be finished, which is really what the book of Revelation is about. See, a lot of people are confused. They think the book of Revelation is about the Antichrist or the beast or the great whore of Babylon, and they get the idea that Revelation is this free-for-all where God steps back and allows the enemy to just wreak havoc on the earth. But the book of Revelation is a revealing of Jesus Christ, and it's a revealing of God's completion or fulfillment of his redemptive workings and the warnings throughout the ages and ultimately the absolute and complete fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And the phrase that there should be delay no longer is incredibly sobering because it implies that the mercy that God has been extending throughout the Old Testament and the time of grace that began over 2,000 years ago when Jesus hung on the cross and died for the sins of the world will be over. And when the seventh trumpet sounds, that those who have rejected opportunity after opportunity to repent and to turn their heart towards the goodness of God will have run out of time and all they'll be left with is the judgment of God. See, that's why the Apostle Paul wrote Romans chapter 2 verse 4 and 5 which says this, 
Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? See, it's God's desire that his goodness draws us to him and draws us to repent of our sin. But the passage goes on and says this, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up or storing up for yourself wrath for the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. See, but again, the dividing line between the goodness and the wrath of God is the posture of our heart concerning the cross of Christ. And let me be honest with you, no one gets a pass. Hebrews 4 says this, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, look at Revelation 10, 7 again. One moment, please. It says this, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. I know, right? What is the mystery of God? I mean, that is, what a fascinating statement. And uh, I've really spent a considerable amount of time digging into this And what I found, I believe, is incredibly significant. The mystery of God is this. It's the fact that all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after the fall of man, God declared to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Yet, For thousands and thousands and thousands of years, sin and Satan have impacted every aspect of our world to the point that there isn't a man, woman, or child that's ever taken a breath who hasn't been affected by the sin of Adam and Eve or impacted by the innate and intense hatred that Satan and his demonic legions have for humanity. And the very fact that sickness and death are part of our reality was brought about by Adam's sin, and even further, the depravity of the fallen nature and sinful humanity knows no limits, which is made absolutely clear on the nightly news and all through the pages of history that are filled with violence and lies, abuse, genocide, and unspeakable acts of evil, to the point that even the earth itself groans under the weight of sin. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 19, says this, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and bought and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. In other words, this redemption that God promised through Jesus Christ not only redeems us, but there is a redemption in this natural world. And I know it's difficult to wrap your head around, but the word of God is telling us that Adam and Eve's sin was of such proportion that there's no aspect of the natural world uh, animated or inanimate around us that was unaffected by it, and that in some way all of creation is longing and eagerly expecting the day that it's free from Satan, from the curse of the fall, and from the corruption of man's sin. My point being that the mystery of God can be summed up in a question. Why did God make a promise of setting all things right in Genesis 3 and then allow sin and Satan to go on seemingly unhindered for thousands of years? Well, I'm glad you asked. Jesus addressed this in Matthew chapter 24 when he responded to his disciples' question, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? To which Jesus gives an extensive answer 
that most people are familiar with. He talks about there'll be wars, there'll be rumors of wars, but it concludes with him talking about the wise and the faithful servant that lives in a constant expectancy and anticipation of his master's return. And then he turns around and contrasts it with the evil servant in the same parable who says, my master has been gone a long time, so I'm going to live however I want and I'm going to do whatever I feel like. And the Bible tells us that those who live life on their own terms, rejecting the grace of God and mocking the return of the Lord, are going to suffer incredible punishment. And you've got to get this in your heart because Jesus is telling them what we already know. And it's this fact that God doesn't owe us any form of explanation for his delay. But on the other hand, he expects us to understand that no one is going to escape being accountable to him for what they think or how they live or what they do. Second Peter 3, beginning in verse 3, says this. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is the coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forgot that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water, by these same waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. And what he's saying is, is that the word of God has established all things and that God's word has never failed. And because it's never failed, regardless of whether we think that God has taken too much time in returning or people begin to doubt that God is actually going to come back, he's telling us that you can count on the word and in the same way that in the time of Noah there was punishment, that there will also be punishment for wickedness at the end of this age. And the Apostle Peter's message is the same as Christ. Regardless of how long it takes for the Lord to return, all of humanity is accountable to God, and anyone who denies this unchanging fact is eventually going to face God in judgment. But still, in spite of the fact that God has left us glimpses into his eternal plan and timing, it's really impossible for us to see the whole picture because it's still unfolding, which is what I said at the very beginning of this video, that the book of Revelation is a revealing of Jesus Christ and God's completion or fulfillment of his redemptive workings and warnings throughout the ages and ultimately the absolute and complete fulfillment of Bible prophecy all of which will converge into a cohesive picture at the sounding of the seventh trumpet judgment. Now, let's keep moving through our text. Revelation 10, verse 8 and 9 says this, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. Now, something that I find really, really interesting in this passage, and I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about, is that distance and access between heaven and earth is different depending on what side of the veil that separates the natural from the supernatural that you're on. Now, if you remember all the way back in Revelation 4, when this vision of John begins, he sees a door standing open in heaven, and as he's caught up in the spirit, he finds himself standing in the throne room of heaven. But without God opening a door in the veil that separates our world from the spiritual realm, the distance between here and there 
is insurmountable, but in Revelation 10, 9, the phrase, and I went to the angel, quite literally means that John left where he was standing in heaven without ever leaving the vision or the experience that he was in, and he went to the angel who was standing on the earth and on the sea, and the feeling that I get from the passage is that from God's vantage point in eternity, the distance between heaven and here is simply a step. And I don't know if you ever think about things like this, but it gives unbelievable perspective to the greatness of God, which is why Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 tells us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. I mean, think about it. As humans, we're so connected to this temporal world and our own problems and our own limitations and the struggles that we face and the, pro and, and the issues that are going on around us that it's easy to lose sight of how, God great, of how great God is and how all the things that we call miraculous are nothing more than simple movements for God. I mean, what an incredible thought. Everything that we consider miraculous and impossible from our perspective is nothing more than a simple movement from God. All right, let's finish out our text for today. Picking up Revelation 10, in verse 10, it says this. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter, and he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And again, the gravity of what's taking place uh, to the Apostle John in this passage really hits me because it reminds us that the message of the gospel has two sides. And if we miss this, the temptation will be, uh, will be for us to gravitate towards those things from God that are sweet and favorable and in doing so, we run the risk of forgetting the depravity of sin and the judgment that was poured out on Christ at the cross for that sin, which created the single greatest line in the sand that this world has ever known with salvation and mercy and goodness and grace on one side. And on the other side, there's nothing left except judgment because people have rejected that salvation and the mercy that was given through Christ on the cross. And I believe that in the context of our passage, the little book that John is told to eat contains the prophetic words of promise, the prophetic words of judgment, the, the prophecies concerning the salvation of Israel, and the coming millennial reign of Christ all these things that were spoken of by God's prophets and what it was doing as he consumed it is it was giving him a complete picture of God's redemptive workings since the fall of man and a complete understanding of the mystery of God, both the sweet and the bitter, and in turn, John knowing that he has to go and he has to continue prophesying to people's tongues, kings, and nations, right? And amazingly, the prophet Ezekiel had a very similar experience. Ezekiel chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, says this, He said to me, Son of man, Eat what you find, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat the scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. Now, as you continue reading this chapter in Ezekiel, we find that he's told that the people he's being sent to are not going to listen to him or heed the warnings because they've already refused to listen to God. But regardless, Ezekiel is commanded to prophesy whether anyone hears him or not. 
And verse 14 closes out this encounter that Ezekiel had by saying this. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heart of my, in, in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was upon me. And just like the Apostle John, we find the grace of God and the judgment of God, the sweet and the bitter. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His goodness is abundant. His mercy is never ending. But if it's rejected, all that a person is left with is judgment. Now, this feels like a good place to stop for this session. But before you go, I'd like to take a moment and pray for you. Let's pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I declare in agreement with your word that at the name of Jesus, that every knee should bow and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. And right now I lift up my ministry partners and I lift up my new friends who are watching. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I take authority over every satanic activity that's directed towards their lives. I take authority over every satanic activity that's directed to their home or their family. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I command it to stop I command right now, Father God, I command right now, God, that the, every agenda of the enemy be broken. And Lord, I break every curse of sickness over their lives and I speak healing. I break every curse of depression or of fear over their lives and I speak the joy of the Lord God. I speak the peace of God. And Father, for those that have lost things, God, and that loss is overwhelming their lives, God, I declare, Father, God, restoration, and I declare that whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And I say to you right now, my friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, be free. Be free in your mind. Be free in your body. Be free in your home. And Lord, I ask that you restore to them the years that have been stolen by the enemy. And I ask that your river of blessing would begin to flow in their lives and that your goodness and mercy would consume them everywhere that they go. And I ask that you let them mark today, God, this very moment as the beginning of blessing like they have never experienced before. And Father, we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, God bless, and I look forward to seeing you next time.